This is a DMT 137 on the 19th of June 2013. This week on the show, Jay Z and Samsung, BMI sues Pandora, Pink Floyd on Spotify, Audium launches, MySpace is out of beta, and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show where we look at and try and make sense of the week's news in the digital music industry. So DMT is available in a variety of formats on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Mixcloud, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. And if you enjoy the show, also check out the YouTube channel where I'm uploading all the interviews that I recorded a couple of weeks ago at the World Creators Summit in Washington DC, which include the interviews with CEOs of a number of PROs as well as publishers, tech companies and industry bodies. So this week I'm thrilled to welcome to the show three great guests. Uh, so first up, uh, Jay Herskowitz uh, returns uh, from New York. Uh, so Jay has worked on a variety of projects in the music mm -hmm. tech space, and he's one of the driving forces behind the project uh, Tomahawk. Uh, so hi, Jay, and thanks for uh, joining us once again. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. Thanks for having me again. It's great to have you. And uh, uh, then we'll have uh, Marcus Taylor, director of the company Venture Harbor, specializing in working with brands uh, in the music, film, and gaming industries, and also runs the Musician's Guide site. So hi, Marcus, and great to have you on. How's it going? Hey, good, good. Awesome. And uh, finally, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Jeff Rice uh, uh, to the show, uh, who is a well-known uh, founder of uh, TuneCore and has also launched a new startup called Audium uh, this week, uh, which sounds very interesting. And we'll be covering that as part of the show uh, later on in the news round. So hi, Jeff, and thanks for coming on. How's it going? It's going well. Thanks for having me. Great. So this week, uh, I thought it would be interesting to start uh, with a story about Jay-Z and Samsung. So, uh, you know, a marketing story for once. So uh, this Sunday, Samsung aired a three-minute advert during the NBA final announcing the release of Jay-Z's latest album uh, called uh, Magna Carta uh, Holy Grail, uh, which will be available for free uh, for one million Samsung device owners uh, three days before the official release via a dedicated app on the Google Play Store. Uh, so this is an interesting deal and reportedly Jay-Z is getting paid five dollars for each of these downloads, so five million dollars in total. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, in the in the past couple of days, we've seen a, a lot of articles come out in terms of well, what does this mean? Uh, does this change the relationship between artists and brands? Uh, is this a new type of uh, sort of patron of the arts model uh, of the 21st century? And uh, we've seen a lot of uh, arguments uh, flying uh, back and forth. But first of all, I want to concentrate on the actual deal and the setup and how it may affect the album release. So, do you think this will work in Jay-Z's favor? Uh, from a marketing point of view. Uh, Jay, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great deal for Jay-Z. I mean, w one, he gets all the money in, in his pocket up front. Uh, two, gets everyone talking about it. You know, yeah. he got that three-minute spot during the NBA Finals. I don't know how much that cost, but it certainly wasn't cheap. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a definite win for, for Jay-Z. Um, for Samsung, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But, yeah. uh, but you know, it's similar. I think a lot of people were talking about the similarity between this deal and what the what Prince did with the Daily Mail cover yeah, mount. Right. Uh, I don't know how many years ago that was, um, but it'll be interesting to see how this plays versus that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And uh, and uh, uh, Jeff, from uh, from your perspective, uh, you know, having worked on a lot of independent releases, uh, how, how do you see this playing out uh, as as a massive giveaway? Well, music, the means to the end with music used to be to sell it. You make money when the music sold. Now yeah. music is a means to a different end. It's either selling hardware, software, market share, or something else. Uh, Samsung has to pay a cost of customer acquisition. It costs them X amount of dollars to go out and acquire someone to buy a Samsung product. So does it cost them less than $5 per unit, or what's their cost to acquire a new customer? Jay-Z is a vehicle to help them acquire customers. And Jay-Z has a better megaphone to reach people than Samsung does because Jay-Z has a more intimate brand. So by paying Jay-Z money, Jay-Z becomes the mouthpiece for Samsung for customer acquisition using his music as the vehicle to do so. I mean, that's frankly, that's what it is. And for Jay-Z, yeah, it's freaking great. Money in his pocket up front. Yeah. Does Jay-Z control the masters on this particular album? Well, that, that was uh, the thing that I, I, I was wondering when I was reading all these articles, because I know that Rock Nation uh, is his label, uh, but it's distributed by Universal, so I'm not sure what kind of slice Universal would get through this deal, if any at all. Well, if he's signed to Universal, then the payment's made to Universal, not to Jay-Z, and then Jay-Z has some split that's being done with Universal. But ultimately, music is now the vehicle that's being used by uh, uh, companies to achieve another end. And, you know, companies are the new record labels. They have pipelines, they have advertisements, they have people that follow them, and if they had access to distribution and access to master recordings, they can repurpose those, promote the artist, and at the same time acquire new customers and up their brand through association. Yeah. Yeah, and Marcus, so what's your take from uh, from a marketing perspective? Do you think uh, this works? Uh, you know, you work with brands a lot as well, so that's interesting to hear your perspective on this. 
Yeah, I, I, I actually really like this one in, in particular. I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out for Samsung, but yeah. I, I mean, my, my initial thoughts, I, you know, it, it looks like a really good deal on, on Jay-Z's um, behalf, but I, I think also the association with Jay-Z that, that Samsung are going to be getting, um, as well as kind of, you know, if a lot of Jay-Z fans, um, you know, are going to get this device on the basis that um, it... it they'll, they'll the be the first people to, yeah. to get the album that's something I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about but um if that does happen then then i think that's that would be very impressive yeah yeah, yeah i mean i don't think there's going to be a, a huge number of people that are going to run out and grab a samsung phone between now and the time that the album's released mm -hmm. with the specific you know goal of getting that album up front um but from a brand halo perspective you know it is one thing that a samsung owner has now to kind of hang over the head of an, mm -hmm. you know, an iphone owner yeah, um, yeah. So I think that's probably, it's not as measurable, but probably as much a, a, of the goal as actually moving devices between now and, I don't even know when it comes out, next week? Uh, it's uh, the 4th of, I think it was Independence Day. 4th of July, from, yeah, yeah, okay. 4th of July, yeah. A couple weeks, yeah. I mean, if you think about it this way, $5 million for the branding, the Halo Association that you've just described is, is a, you know, that's pocket change for Samsung. Right. How else go this? They could have done a five million dollar media buy, which would have been I don't know how many spots. Or think of the way this thing is just going to ripple virally and through blogs and Twitter spheres and, and sharing and so on. So a five million dollar buy for this amount of branding and notoriety is a great deal. Yeah, it's an interesting deal actually as well because uh, if if the the money is being paid for the rec for the recording for the album itself, uh, then there is a there is a whole host of people that are going to get paid through this deal and not just Jay Z. Whilst Jay Z could have quite as easily decided to do just a personality deal and gotten probably the same amount of money, uh, but keeping all that money himself essentially. So well, he's getting both now. Yeah, right. right. He, you know, Jay Z monetizes his fame. Traditionally, they did it by selling music, but now with disintermediation and technology, there's new ways to monetize your fame. And, you know, he's getting the best of both worlds. He's getting the personality branding while simultaneously generating revenue through something he created, his music, right? He gets yeah. two for one. Yeah. And Jay, does it sound like a lot, just in terms of numbers, one million? It, uh, as far as I can tell, these are restricted to U.S. devices. It sounds like a lot of copies to be given out. And because you have to actually have an active path between... Uh, you know, the user actually coming to know about what's happening and then going to search for the app on the, on the, on the Play Store and actually downloading it and having the, the album on their, on their phone. It sounds like there's a lot of steps and a lot of awareness that has to be made on Samsung's part. And I, I almost feel like if it's just US only, like, are they going to be able to give away a million albums? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think they'll have a problem giving away a million albums. I yeah. am really interested in what the user experience is going to be. Uh, for it and you know it sounds like you're going to have to download an app to download the album um, which you know is it's not seamless but it's not terrible given the fact that you can then listen to the album within the whatever media player on your phone that you're already using yeah. as opposed to having a dedicated app to stream only that album yeah. so um, I don't think it will be that bad you know people always talk about the friction of downloading apps but how many millions of apps are downloaded every day um, it's a little bit of a pain but I don't think it's going to stop people from getting a free free yeah. album yeah, sure. It's funny. I, I'm just I'm thinking about the way it used to be and how quickly we get our tolerance level changes. Right? It used to be we would get a coupon that we'd have to drive to Tower Records to redeems and then drive back and put it in the, into our CD player. Right? And now it's like, oh shoot, I have to click a button and download an app. Right. <laughs> And Marcus, uh, in terms of charts, uh, like that, that's one of one of the points that people have made is the fact that these uh, re these sales are not going to be eligible. Do you think that artists don't care as much about charts anymore, and that's why Jay Z was happy to go with this deal? Um, I hadn't I hadn't really put too much thought into into the charting side of it, but I I mean I guess from Jay Z's perspective, if he's um, you know if he's getting all, all of this branding from it and getting um, you know the million sales um, pre ordered then uh, and on top of all the kind of publicity that's that's going to go around this i think you know if, if that ripple effect that, that that can then cause will sort of um drive drive other sales and kind of stuff elsewhere then um you know i think then that's kind of it, it kind of outweighs um if he were to do it in a kind of traditional release yeah that's right. That's right. It also shows the irrelevance of charts, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, it will be interesting to see how cannibalistic it is from the charting data, but I think it's not going to have that big of an adverse effect to how it's going to chart when it releases anyway, because A, everyone's going to be talking about it, all the Samsung owners are going to be talking about it. So 
as soon as it hits streaming services, everyone's going to listen to it there. So it's going to hit to the top of the of the streaming charts. It'll be interesting to see what it does in the download charts. But um, yeah. I don't. I, I, I think it's still going to do extremely well there. Not that that's a stretch to say for Jay Z, yeah. but. Okay. You know. <laughs> cool. Well, well, we'll keep an eye on that, and uh, we'll try and get some reports from people that have Samsung phones in the U.S. Uh, to let us know how that whole experience went, as well. And uh, also, like, uh, I want to. A talk uh, relatively briefly because we talked about this a lot last week uh, but uh, just touch uh, on uh, the Pandora story and the fact that uh, uh, BMI is now suing Pandora uh, so we talked at uh, length last week about the acquisition of Pandora of uh, terrestrial radio to get more favor- favorable rates from ASCAP uh, you know uh, in the op-ed by Pandora the company blamed ASCAP and BMI uh, for publisher resorting to direct licensing schemes uh, and this week it emerged that BMI is suing Pandora and Forbes reports that the organization representing uh, 600,000 songwriters has filed uh, with the f- federal rate court to, to uh, get them to set an agreeable publishing rate for Pandora to pay after they, the, the two companies didn't manage to come to an agreement. And, and this is actually the first lawsuit in uh, BMI's 18 years history, uh, at least that's what the article reported. So it's not a company that has a history of, of being uh, litigious in, in, that, in that sense. Uh, so uh, what is your sense on on uh, BMI's uh, option at this point. Uh, uh, it seems like they ran out of options and they had to go to the rate courts. Uh, and is this the only way that this could have played out? Uh, Jeff, I know that you have quite a lot of uh, insight into, into this kind of dealing. So what, what's your thoughts on, on it? Well, actually, I just wrote an article up on Hypebot about this yesterday. I mean, Pandora's going for the jugular, right? Pandora has a choice. It can innovate, which increases its value, thereby increasing its revenue through advertising, which apparently it doesn't want to put money into, or it can lobby the U.S. Congress in order to pass legislation to compel artists to have to give Pandora its music at a rate that the government sets, not allowing the artists to have a free market choice and setting their own rates. Right. I mean, so they've chosen to go the path of forcing artists to have to make less money and give them their music. And if they're not getting what they want, they're going to lobby the U.S. government in order to get it or buy FM radio stations to drive drown uh, the costs they have to pay by piggybacking off of royalty rates from a South Dakota radio station. I think it's disgusting. And I think Pandora should do what YouTube does, innovate. Right? If you innovate and become of more value, people want to use your service, but you're choosing to go the other path, which is compelled. So actually, there is something that can be done. Yeah. Right. BMI and ASCAP, with all due respect, are, operate under a United States consent decree, which means they are required by law to issue a license. They can't say no. The rate of the license is what can be negotiated. But here's where it gets really interesting. See, BMI and ASCAP are non-exclusive. Yeah. So if you're a songwriter or publisher of ASCAP or BMI, you're also allowed under the United States consent decree to withdraw your rights from ASCAP or BMI specifically for just Pandora. So imagine if the million members of ASCAP and BMI simultaneously withdrew their rights of public performance for Pandora from ASCAP and BMI. Guess what? Pandora couldn't play any version of those songs. They're dead in the water. And everyone would say, screw you, up the money you're paying, or we're not going to allow you to do that. Oh, and by the way, Apple's launching its new service next month. You know what? We're going to let them use it while you guys go down. I mean, that's what I would do, and that's yeah. what I suggest people do. Withdraw your rights and send a notification to Pandora telling them that they've been withdrawn. Now if they use your song, they're willfully infringing on your copyright. You can sue them and put, them, put their neck on the chopping block like they're doing to the world's artists right now because it pisses me off. And it's that, not the artist's responsibility to make, have Pandora have a $20 billion market cap. Yeah. And, and Jay, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think Pandora is shooting itself in the foot by antagonizing uh, essentially all of the rights holders from the, from the master owners to the publishers? Yeah, you know, um, you know, I've got kind of fairly kind of uh, unformed and still kind of nascent thoughts on, on the way this plays out. I mean, one, uh, if terrestrial radio stations are, uh, uh, are are able to get rates that are unavailable to people that don't in, and own terrestrial stations, then them buying a station, even if it is in South Dakota, you know, more power to them. People do this with tax laws all the time. You work within the, the framework that you're given, so you try to do it. The more interesting thing, I think, about kind of the anti-Pandora um, movement that's going on is how they are, and maybe rightfully so, I don't know, but how they are be painted as kind of the bad guy in all this where everybody is kind of heralding what's going on with iTunes and everybody else and the radio. But what I would love to learn more about, because I don't know what the deals look like, and I don't know if anybody knows what the deals look like, is that whether the direct deals that the labels and publishers are doing with uh, Apple is actually going to end up for turning into less money into these artists' pockets because, you know, it's not, hey, 45% to the artist, 5% to the, to the union. 
it is whatever deal that that, la that artist happened to cut with the label. So what, what I'm wondering is whether these things like Apple and the direct deals are going to turn out to be worse deal for the artists than what they're getting through uh, kind of what's been uh, um, uh, stipulated through um, uh, through sign exchange and through the, uh, the, the, you know, the rights and, and the organizations that are covered under the uh, statutory. Yeah, exactly. Marcus, on, on, on your side, like looking at this from outside, from the UK, uh, what, what, what are your feelings? Because uh, I mean, I'm an outsider as well in this, you know, kind of looking at it from, from, from a distance. Um, I, I, to be honest, I haven't really been, been following this one um, in much length. But I, I read, read some sort of stuff and it, it kind of, it almost seemed from, from the way that sort of Pandora were, were justifying what they were doing, that they were kind of, they, they felt discriminated against um, uh, because some of their competitors, I think um, iHeartRadio and stuff, were, were being treated slightly differently. Yeah. Um, but it, it's kind of, they're, they're Pandora. The, you know, they're, they're a completely different ball game um, in some respects. So yeah. and, and from like from like a, a gut feeling, like uh, which is actually good that you haven't followed it that closely. Like in terms of like the headlines that you've seen and what you've seen so far online. Uh, how do you feel this is playing out? Is it playing out in Pandora's favor that you know that they are being crushed by by the by the rights, or is it playing out in the rights holders' favor that they're being crushed by Pandora? Um, I think definitely um, siding more with kind of what what Jeff was saying. Like it definitely yeah. doesn't isn't making Pandora look too popular um, from the artist's perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's so a yeah, interesting I, story. Yeah, I sure. agree. It, it, it's more than just Pandora. To to your point. But Pandora has become the perfect foil for us to work off against. And what I mean by that is you have Tim Westergren, who began this as the Genome Project, and he, his heart was in the right place and probably still is. It was done as an effort out of a love for music and to support musicians, but over time that morphed into something called Pandora. And then they brought in the guy as a CEO who used to be the head of Saturn Cars, right? Um, and it became a traditional corporate entity with a bottom line that they have to meet uh, with quarterly earnings to raise their market cap. And that's where things got weird because it was Pandora as being an innovator and leader. And they say pioneers get arrows in their back. That's what's happening. Yeah. They're trying to change the way things work so they can make more money by lowering the costs of the commodity that they're looking to use to make money from. Right? They want to use other people's music. So they have a choice. They can make their own music. Right? And use that, cost them nothing except the cost of making the music. The problem is it's very expensive or difficult to make a hotel California. Oh, I guess that means music has value, so pay for it. Right, But this is the beginning for me. This isn't just it's only about Pandora. Because they've been public saying we love artists, we support artists, while simultaneously lobbying to lower the rates that the artists are getting paid, they become the perfect sort of target to go after. But once you accomplish it with Pandora, you set a precedent. And that precedent can be repurposed yeah. with anybody from Apple to iHeartRadio. The other important difference is the majority of artists these days are not signed to record labels. The majority of music and copyrights being created are happening outside of the traditional system. So things like sound exchange in the United States, which split the money that comes in off the public performance of the recording, going some to the lead uh, performer and some to the record label. In the new model, the artist is both the lead performer and the record label, so they don't need that split. In the old model, that split is needed. So there's an old world and a new world issue as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, moving on from Pandora, because uh, I, know, I know this is uh, like one of the really key stories uh, to watch uh, in, in the US especially, uh, but uh, I'm sure we'll be covering that in the, in the coming weeks as well as this lawsuit proceeds and we hear what the rates uh, are going to be set at. Uh, you know, another another story that came out this week uh, in the last few days uh, was uh, the fact that one of the uh, last holdouts uh, from Spotify uh, uh, has uh, finally capitulated and Pink Floyd have joined, uh, joined the fold and all their catalog is now available on Spotify uh, also for free users. Uh, the band though uh, put like an interesting spin on uh, the release of their material by saying that they would only do so if uh, Wish You Were Here had reached 1 million plays on the service, which it did within like, I think, uh, th three or four days, uh, of course. Uh, and uh, so now the catalog is actually available. And uh, so this is another whole lot of falls. And there are only a few uh, major ones left, uh, including the Beatles, ACDC, uh, Led Zeppelin, and uh, Peter Gabriel, which are like artists that you can't find uh, on uh, Spotify these days yet. Uh, so first of all, uh, do you guys reckon that they set the bar too low by, by setting a 1 million? and they could have easily like set it at 10 million and still achieve the unlocking at some point and uh, and also uh, you know where do you guys see uh, 
the Axis are still holding out? And do you think that we're going to see more of them coming to the fold, or are the ones that are left uh, really like principally against uh, uh, streaming? And so we can't really expect them to see them uh, on the services at any time soon. Uh, Marcus, uh, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I. Uh... In terms of whether one million was too low, I, th I think that's almost irrelevant in a way because yeah. if you look at that financially, that's that's pocket money for for someone like Pink Floyd. Yeah. Um, so I think really it come, you know, wh why do you say one million? Well, I, I think that's largely to make a, a, a PR story. And yeah. is ten million a better story than one million? Probably not. Um, so uh, I think um, I think one million was kind of more to just drive hype and you know I, I don't think you're also going to get people listening to the same songs 10 times as much yeah. um, in terms of whether other, other people will, will come around to it probably um, just I think as these services justify um, that streaming is kind of having a positive impact um, for the artist I, I think that will kind of um, over time sort of twist twist the arms of, of these other artists who, who aren't using yeah. um, these, these streaming services. Yeah, and it, it might, it, you know, if, if the Beatles wait as long as they do with iTunes, we'll probably can expect to see the Beatles on Spotify in 2020 or, <laughs> 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 or in 2019 or something like that. Uh, Jay, what, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the Pink Floyd thing, I agree. I mean, that was, and I don't even know if that was a Pink Floyd, um, uh, uh, you know, marketing push or if that was a Spotify push because my understanding is RDO had the whole catalog that day, yeah. right? And so that very well could have just been somebody at Spotify like, hey, let's, you know, we're going to spin this up. All they had to do is unlock the rest of the catalog. You know, they can just sit there and look at the play counts and unlock it when they wanted to unlock it. So, yeah. um, so I, thought it was, I thought it was smart from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, they got all the press about it. Uh, RDO didn't get any press about it. For all I know that, you know, Mog and, and, and Deezer and everybody else has it too. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I would assume that they do. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I agree, like, didn't need to be higher. It just needed to be a big number that everyone can yeah. say they, they hit in a really, in a really uh, short time frame. As for the other artists, I think they all eventually come. But, you know, every day that they wait, the kind of the less relevant they become. Yeah. Um, you know, as new generation hears about music and this is the way they hear about it, um, if they don't hear the Beatles and they don't hear Zeppelin because uh, they're not listening to, to, to you know, the traditional, uh, you know, formats that we're all, always listening to, becomes less relevant. So I think at some point there's going to be kind of, you know, the paths cross between um, where the return makes sense for them and they'll say, yeah. you know, pull the trigger and put them up there. So Yeah, and a pet peeve of mine is Peter Gabriel because, because, you know, he's such an investor in technology as well and I just, he invested in Wii 7 and so I just, I just can't understand why his catalog is not, is not on Spotify. Well, it was actually really interesting. I, I read all those uh, articles last week about uh, Jason Isbell um, uh, from uh, Drive-By Truckers who was basically railing against Spotify, how it was evil, you know, incarnate, and it was the worst thing ever. So I assumed he was a holdout, um, but he's not. He's up there. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I streamed the album the other day from him. So, you know, I didn't even look because I figured, oh, he must not be there, but yeah, yeah. he was there. Yeah. Jeff, you know, any uh, holdouts going to stay up or, or not? Well, I mean, if you're an artist, you have to have your music available for the consumers to listen to in the ways they listen to it. I mean, it's like uh, when CDs came out, if you were against CDs, you released your music on 8-track. Yeah. You know, at a certain point, you get, you've got a cave or your art doesn't get heard. Um, you know, so it's not so much whether or not they'll be there. I think it's more of a, a fight over rates. But what I found interesting, I, I popped off here for two seconds. Pink Floyd stuff is already available to listen to as on-demand streams. You just go to YouTube. So uh, <laughs> it, it's kind of a moot point in many ways because it's already there. So um, the other thing is, as a legacy established artist, you certainly don't need the extra X amount of dollars from Spotify to pad your bank account. It's not going to really make or break you. But as an up and coming developing artist, you know, an extra 20 bucks, 50 bucks, you know, that's gas money or guitar strings. And it can make a difference. So plus your point is it's, it's a way to get discovered is very relevant and important. Yeah. So I view it more of a, of a rate battle in an art versus commerce, because if you're Pink Floyd, you do have the luxury of deciding that the wall is supposed to be listened to in its entirety on a piece of vinyl, which very oddly enough, though, was created based on tech, technology limitations, right? <laughs> you can't have more than about 25 minutes on exactly. each side of a piece of vinyl, and, you know, that's completely arbitrary as well, so... 
yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, well, uh, Jeff, so just staying on you for, for a couple of minutes, so I just wanted to ask you about Audium. You know, you launched the service uh, this week. I assume it's in, a, in a, some sort of beta. Uh, so can you just walk us through uh, 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 shortly what it does and, and how you came, came up with it? Sure. The concept behind it is to get artists paid when their music is used on YouTube. For example, you can turn YouTube into Kickstarter. Tell your fans to cover your songs, and when they cover your songs now, you'll get paid. Yep. Tell your fans to use the recordings of your songs in their own videos, and when they do, you'll get paid. Uh, that economic model exists within YouTube, but to this point in time, really hasn't been available to the everyman. It's only been available to the more established entities, the more established major record labels or publishing entities, due to the way the whole thing shakes out. So I was just looking at the marketplace, and you know, there's about 30 billion views a month on YouTube of videos with music in them. And of the 30 billion views a month, about half of them are generating money for these usually traditional infrastructure. And they're doing about $700 million a year in revenue. So what about the other 15 billion views a month? Well, that's kind of the everybody else. And my thought was, well, geez, there needs to be an easy button for the artist. They need to be able to go to one place, click a button, get all the money off of YouTube when their music is used. And that was the concept behind Audium. I see YouTube as the new iTunes. It's sexy. It's the number one destination site on the planet for music discovery and streaming and sharing. It kicks the, the crap out of everybody else. Um, and there's this ridiculous ecosystem that exists where you as the artist can empower your fans to use your copyrights and then make money on it. And everybody wins. YouTube is going out and doing the licensing, and then advertisers are paying the money for the costs of the use of the music and the videos. So yep. let's just put the button in and empower everybody. Great. And so, so your deals are, you have to have a deal directly with YouTube in order to enable this process to, to work? How, how, how does that process work? So, uh, not to dominate this, so very quickly, if you sure. take a video of your three fingers wiggling, you control the copyright to that video. And if you upload it to YouTube, you can tell YouTube to put an advertisement on it. And when they do, YouTube takes 45% of the money and pays you the other 55%. Right? It gets complicated when there's a song added to the three fingers. Let's put I Will Always Love You into that song. Now you've got three copyrights. One for the video itself, one for the recording of the song. Right? Arista Records hired Whitney Houston to sing it, and they own the recording. And one for Dolly Parton because she wrote the lyrics and the melody, the yeah. publishing. So all three of these entities have to say yes in order for there to be an ad put on it. But for Arista Records or Dolly Parton to say yes, they need to have what's called a direct licensing contract with YouTube. And what this contract does, it allows Arista Records to say, hey, YouTube, I control the copyrights to these recordings. And then YouTube goes, great, go find the videos on YouTube that have those recordings in them. Tell us about it and tell us what you want us to do. And Arista Records goes, well, I'd like you to put advertisements on them. Take them down or do nothing. They get to pick one of the three. Yeah. And YouTube also tells Arista Records, send us a copy of your recording. And what we'll do is we'll fingerprint it. And we'll take this fingerprint and we'll scan the billions and billions and billions of videos, past, present, and future, looking for a forensic match. And when we do, you can log into a system and see all the hundreds of thousands of videos that have your recordings in them. And you literally can click a button and tell us that it's okay to sell ads against these user-generated videos. Right? And so those are very difficult contracts to get for a whole variety of reasons because sure. with those contracts, you kind of have an uber power where you can log into YouTube and you could potentially claim any video and say, my copyrights are in it from Michael Jackson <laughs> to the Beatles to anything yeah, else. Sure. So yeah, yeah. it's a bit restricted and you need the one for the publishing and you need one for the master. And I wanted to provide that to the everybody. That's great. Well, it sounds really interesting. And so I'll go and check out, is there, is there a website, audium.com or anything like that? Yeah, A-U-D-I-A-M. Great, perfect. Well, thank you so much for, for explaining that to us. And uh, sure. uh, whilst we're talking about projects, uh, Jay, anything new on the Tomahawk front uh, for you? Uh, yeah, always. Um, there's uh, getting close to, a, to another release uh, that's going to have a bunch of new stuff in it. Um, awesome. You know, so uh, that's obviously very vague, but we continue to crank away on that. Open source project, always looking for more contributors. We've got about 85 contributors from all over the world, um, cleaning up and adding all kinds of cool features, some new resolvers coming up. Um, some new aesthetic and design. It's all going to be good. And then we're also working on um, a, a new project that's related to Tomahawk, although not directly Tomahawk, that uh, I look forward to telling you much more about 
yeah. in a relatively near future. Right. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, check I, it out. I, 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 I saw the name. I, I checked out your LinkedIn before before the show, and I saw a new name, and I was like, oh, I wonder if this is a new project. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. Uh, it is nice. uh, directly related, but uh, but not the same. So uh, you exactly. know, as Tomahawk will always be open source. Yeah. Um, this is something that we kind of see as a complementary product to that. What does Tomahawk do? Tomahawk is a, a multi-source uh, music player. So essentially, it's got plugins for various sources: Spotify, uh, you know, SoundCloud, YouTube, uh, Official FM, whatever. Uh, and basically, what it'll do is it decouples the metadata from the track from the source. So it works, starts to work as an interoperability layer across all the various service providers and territories because when you share a song with me, I don't necessarily listen to it from the same place you do. So basically it reassembles um, the metadata with whatever source the listener has available to them given their current state of the world. Um, yeah, cool. And we'll just find the best match, yeah. So, Great, um, and, that, uh, and if, you, if you want to uh, know more about Tomahawk, there's uh, at, at least one, if not two shows, where we talk about it with both uh, uh, Jay and uh, uh, Sid Lawrence. Uh, and so uh, I'll be sure to pop those links in the show notes as well, so you can go back and refer to those shows and learn all about Tomahawk. And, and Marcus, uh, finally, uh, just, uh, I thought, you know, I, I, do the, I do the personal projects in the middle of the show just because uh, uh, sometimes we leave it to the end and then we don't have any time left and it's kind of, uh, it gets le- left out. Uh, Marcus, anything your end that you want to you wanna talk about uh, from, from what you're doing? Um, yeah, I mean, Venture Harbor, we're um, pretty busy at the moment, just kind of going more into the film and game, game space. Um, particularly with a lot of kind of content marketing at the moment, because um, we, we sort of do digital marketing um, across the board from sort of SEO, conversion, mobile content. Um, but it, we've got a lot of sort of exciting stuff at the moment around interactive infographics. And um, so I'm trying to get my head around a lot of that and, and sort of doing Facebook um, applications and ads for all of that. So cool. definitely keeping busy and and. Yeah, good awesome. fun. And that's adventureharbor.com, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And Tomahawk is Tomahawk, Tomahawk player, uh, dot. You can just get Tomahawk.com. Tomahawk.com, it, it, okay, great. Yeah, awesome. yeah, get, get Tomahawk.com. It also resides at Tomahawk-player.org. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, cool. Well, let's move on and let's talk about uh, this kind of uh, uh, blog post that Mark Mulligan put out on his music industry blog, uh, just talking about the fact that he's heard of reports that uh, uh, sometimes when you, uh, you know, some users, when they were doing a, a search for a song on Google, uh, they were getting the track to automatically play in the results page, which is a, which is an interesting thing. And he, he himself wasn't even sure if this was uh, something that, that, you know, to, to be absolutely certain about or not, because the re- re- reports are quite sporadic. Uh, but uh, you know, he was wondering whether Google is trialing a music playback directly in the search window. So I just wanted to throw that notion out there to you guys and just uh, uh, do the rounds and see what what you think about this. You know, uh, I hate autoplay, so I would hate for that to happen. Uh, but uh, you know, do you reckon that this is something that Google could be trialing out just as a as a early alpha or anything like that? Uh, I don't know, Jay. Uh, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think it would be a pretty expensive proposition, yeah. uh, given that the PROs would come and say, "Well, you know, how many billion searches you're getting for <laughs> for music, um, <laughs> you know, that, that that's a public performance." Um, but um, you know, I, I think um, I think it's an interesting notion to to pair that. You know, given my kind of philosophy and worldview, I would say it's the wrong thing for them to do to be streaming samples directly from their head end to every user, given that all those users may have relationships with other service providers. Yeah. I'd much prefer that they basically send metadata about what it is and that you know talks to the user's uh, machine and the user sources that locally, because if they do have a relationship with a subscription music provider, they can play the whole song. And YouTube yeah. does, you know, Google doesn't play anything and the, and the user's happy because it's uh, you know, automated playback and whatever they have. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I was surprised when I saw Mark say that he, he ran into that. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I can't foresee that being a publicly launched um, product thing, thing, but you know, maybe. I mean, it would be it would be relatively nice if it was a, something of an add-on to uh, to the you know all access uh, play Play Store. So that if you were a subscriber and Google knows that and you're signed into Chrome, right, and then that kind of gets embedded into. So if you do a search, it comes up with the song. So that would that would make more sense, I guess. But I don't know, Jeff. Uh, that's that's too, too expensive proposition, isn't it, for you as well? Well, I mean, Google already did this. They did this deal with MySpace a number of years ago where you would search and then the search results would pop up on Google and you'd have the ability to click and play the entire song. Um, so this is hardly something new, number one. Number two, Google Play has acquired the rights uh, to the masters and compositions to be used in this manner. And uh, whether it happens at Google Play or in Google Search is irrelevant, right? And the interesting point to, to Jay's point 
it'd be nice to see, you know, a choice, but at the same time, there's been a homogenization of music stores. I mean, in the old days, Tower Records used to have things that, you know, uh, other music didn't have in New York and other, you know, so you had specialty stores. Now, every record service, every music service has the exact same content as everybody else. There's, there's no special specialization anymore. So it has been homogenized. Um, then it becomes a matter of the convenience and feature sets. So as I understand it, the Google Play agreements allow in it for the use of, you know, preview clips or even full length streams, as long as they're meeting the definition of what's in the Google Play agreements, it doesn't impose or impinge on anybody. And there's already a public performance license granted for that use. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, Marcus, would you, would you like that feature to pop up or would you hate it? Um, personally, well, I, I think what, what's interesting about this is the fact that uh, I had a look at some of the, the search volumes around this, and there are over 30 million people who, are look, who go to Google every single month searching for music. Um, now, that's a, a hell of a lot of people that, that Google have to, um, you know, ba based on Google's uh, mission statement with Google Search, um, they have to deliver the best result to people as quickly as possible. And if you search for, for pretty much any major artist album or, or track at the moment, it takes between four and five clicks or, or listening to 20 seconds, 30 seconds of, um, of some sort of spiel or, or ads before you can actually listen or download um, a, a good result. And so combined with all the sort of government pressure around illegal downloading, I think Google um, are, are kind of in this position where they... I think Google Play Music All Access is has quite a lot to do with improving search um, because, I mean, from Google's perspective, they're not really... Music streaming is not that profitable in terms of, in Google terms, yeah. but improving their search engine is incredibly profitable. Um, so I think... Um, and, and what kind of confirms this is if you look in some of the, the source code um, behind some of Google Play Music All Access... Um, the, the album pages, they're, they're very heavily marked up um, right. with some of this schema, schema.org markup, um, which shows that they want this data, um, this uh, content um, to come up to be shown really nicely in search results. Um, so I, 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 I was unsure about Mark's post because I, I, I've sort of done some looking around and I can't find any um, ind that. indication or, or reference that this is happening, but the fact that Google have integrated schema.org um, data and, and the fact that they're Google and they have you know, 30 million plus people looking for music in their search engine suggests that it's, it's incredibly likely that um, this is going to be integrated. By the way, an interesting, an interesting point that Jay brought up, again, it's a public performance point. You know, Virgin Megastore, which sold T-shirts and buttons and video games and DVDs, etc., had music in it as well. In the United States, the law indicated that Virgin Megastore did not need to pay for the right of public performance. To, you know, no physical retail store, music store in the U.S. had to pay for public performance in order to play the music in the store. Right, so here we are. You kind of look at it in the oh. virtual way, and just provide, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Yeah, it's yeah. just a reference point. So here we are with Virgin Megastore using music as a way, or Best Buy, using music as a way to get people into the store, right? Playing it publicly at the same time selling other items, and that's very analogous to Google, yeah. right? They're using music as a way to up the cost of the advertising. So it's a different product. Uh, but in the physical world, retail stores did not need to pay for the right of public performance, whereas they do online for those preview clips. Yeah, uh, it would. Right. I was going to say it would be interesting if Google made the argument that search results is their store, right? Yeah. Although yeah. I, I think I think you know the point about autoplay it is I, I can't imagine that even if they do do it, I can't imagine they keep autoplay because I'm sure you guys are like me. I'm listening to music all day long, and if when I'm browsing, all of a sudden I'm hearing clips of various other stuff. Yeah. Uh, popping up over what I'm listening to, that's going to be... Uh, uh, Super annoying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And, okay, I don't want to sort of um, 
keep bashing MySpace, but I think we have to talk about MySpace uh, uh, as a. Uh, I don't think last, we have a last... choice. No, I don't think we have a choice, unfortunately. <laughs> but but I just want to uh, you know talk about you know the last story for today, which is uh, uh, MySpace, uh, uh, you know, removing the the beta from from the from the, from its new uh, its new product, uh, and you know it's now open to everyone. And they also launched an iOS app that allows browse, browsing, uh, uh, listening, and exploring of uh, of of you know pages. Uh, although I couldn't really get the radio uh, feature to work. I'm not sure if it's because I'm in the UK or anything. Uh, and also it allows you randomly to shoot uh, animated GIFs, uh, GIFs uh, to post on the site, which is a kind of a, it's kind of a nice nod, I guess, to MySpace's pioneering role in the de deployment of GIFs uh, all across the internet, <laughs> which have uh, uh, recently had a bit of a resurgence on the web. So uh, the company is apparently spending also $20 million on advertising, uh, which I didn't even know they had that, that amount of money to spend uh, on something like an advertising campaign aimed at driving users uh, to the site and to the app. And it's very bullish about its radio feature as well. It says, you know, that it, you know, its personalized playlists are much better than uh, the iTunes radio offering, even because Apple has chosen an algorithmic approach and they are going for a, you know, a personal approach for on, on playlisting. So, I mean, I remain skeptical about it, uh, and I don't know whether people are gonna, uh, you know, go and st stay on, on on the new site. But I just want to hear your opinions on uh, both, uh, you know, the the developments of the beta as it progressed since launch, and also if you have tried out the iOS app, I would like love to hear what what you think about it, um, uh, Marcus. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm similarly quite skeptical um, about whether it, it's going to be that big or not. But I mean, it, it kind of strikes me that MySpace are almost going through this identity crisis because. Um, they, it, from what I've sort of read, it, it doesn't seem like they really have a, a clear idea on what it is they're doing. It's kind of social radio plus a this Vine GIF tool. Yeah. Um, plus, they're they're talking about kind of having it as a platform for artists as well. So it, it almost seems that they're being pulled in a few different directions. That said, I, I was extremely impressed with the um, the user experience. Um, which is something that I think MySpace really struggled with in the past. Um, I, I kind of I tried it out expecting to have all these pop-ups and to be listening to one genre and then be redirected to something completely different. Um, but it's actually the, the the UI that they've they've gone for is is pretty nice and and so they, it does seem like they're making progress. Um, but I'm still skeptical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Jay, your thoughts on the new MySpace? Have you tried out the new app? I have not tried out the iOS app. I looked uh, at the, the site redesign, and I thought um, it's pretty, but kind of unusable, and I don't know why I would go there. Yeah. And, and, and I don't say that to sound, you know, like a dick, but it was, <laughs> no, absolutely. you know, aesthetically, it's very pretty. A horizontal scroll on a website just, you know, I just don't think works. Um, it's hard to scroll horizontally. Um, and, um, you know, there's some music there and you can play it. It's cool. But the question was, you know, why would, what was the kind of compelling reason that people would come there from where they already are? Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if I found that. Um, Absolutely. so, you know, it's, so it, it's a product that's, you know, somewhat nicely done, but, uh, you know, unclear yeah. as to why, I, why I'd use it over what I'm already using. Yeah. And Jeff, for you, you know, that, does it warrant uh, that, that kind of advertising spend? And also, uh, from, a, from an independence perspective, I know they've had a lot of issues with uh, Merlin, for example, uh, at launch, and I, I'm not sure if those are still ongoing or not. But uh, yeah, they, they didn't have a good vibe at launch because of those issues. So what are your thoughts on the new MySpace? Well, I haven't visited MySpace in three years. I haven't had a, a, a reason to. I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Yeah. And it's not even in the forefront of my mind. So you guys have me at a disadvantage. But to me, that speaks volumes. Like, I, I, <laughs> if, And I'm supposed to know this stuff. If I feel absolutely no reason to go there, why is anyone else? Yeah. I think we're just trying it out just for kicks. But. I, I mean, I don't mean to put you guys down. I just yeah, like... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the interesting point about the twenty million, you know, in light of our earlier conversation, uh, they could have given away um, uh, uh, twenty million. <laughs> they could have they, they could have given away four million uh, four million Jay Z albums, right? Yeah, um, they could have paid me to use the service. Yeah, I'll yeah, send you a right. check for ten bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see. I thought they were going to do more with Justin Timberlake with the release of his album, and it was kind of like, 
you know. Uh, but it's just like, but what, what could they possibly do at this point that hasn't been done? They're not going to have music that other places don't have. They don't have the user base. They don't have integration into hardware. They don't have proprietary operating systems. They have a brand name which is tarnished to all hell. They, you know. I, I don't get it, but, you know, I've been wrong before. <laughs> yeah, even Justin Timberlake himself, I mean, as much as he pushed it as South by Southwest, uh, he still, like, operated on a completely traditional model for the marketing of his album, and, and that wasn't reliant in any way, shape, or form on, on MySpace. I think the only thing that he pushed on was when he did the free gig at South by Southwest, you had to uh, sign into the new MySpace in order to be allowed in. Mm. So I think that was the only really major driver that I've seen him push on for the campaign of the album. I mean, yeah. Apple have half a billion people registered with them with credit cards on file. <laughs> and how many hundreds of millions of, of hardware devices? I mean, it, with yeah. the integration to, in Google, I mean, so, sorry. I just, I don't get it. I, I, I just watch these struggling entrepreneurs trying to raise money for their organizations <laughs> with some great ideas. You know, look at you and Tomahawk. <clears throat> and, you know, and then you look at the money being poured into MySpace and it's just like, oh, dear God. You know? <laughs> they're doing, yeah, that's right. I mean, you could certainly make an argument, and I think, you know, lots of people do, that um, that product and site would be getting a lot more uh, uh, um, positive feet, press and, and response if it wasn't called MySpace. Yeah. Right? Well, look, just, we can revive Friendster next. I mean. <laughs> right. It's just, su it's just such, a, uh, such an albatross around the right. It was the same thing when I was at um, uh, um, New Music Seminar. Um, there was a guy up there from, from Boink, you know, Beyond Oblivion. And I'm just wow. thinking, why would you keep that name? <laughs> you know, why, there's no nothing good that comes out of being associated with that with that brand. So yeah. uh, I was just more shocked that somebody like the people say, like, oh, "Well, a brand exists before, therefore let's let, let's capitalize on it." When I think most of the time, um, if the brand's already been tarnished, you're doing more much more harm than good. Well, one brief mention is the fact that uh, the uh, application or you know website Songbird has uh, uh, called it a day uh, after you know uh, they finished the money uh, they couldn't raise another round. I haven't personally ever used it, or uh, to be honest, I haven't heard about it for years, so I'm not surprised. Uh, so I don't really even want to comment on this, but it was just like I mentioned for the for the news round that I think uh, should be in there. And uh, uh, finally, uh, I wanted to ask you guys if you, I, I know, uh, Jay, you, I think you tried it out, but uh, there's a, I wanted to do a, a shout out to a, a new application launching tomorrow called Soundwave, mm. uh, which is an interesting way of uh, uh, having like a feed of everything that you're listening to and also what uh, your friends are listening to into one sort of a neatly packaged uh, application. I, I know you, Jay, tried it out. I don't know if any of you guys have, have yet, but uh, Jay, what were your thoughts on that? I just, just, uh, just wanted to give him a shout out in case is, uh, the audience wants to go and check it out. Yeah, no, I think it's a very nicely done um, app, and you know, I, I'm a fan of uh, the similar kind of uh, philosophy they have, where you know, people listen to stuff from all over the place, uh, and a way to kind of pull in, you know, and 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 kind of decouple the sources from uh, the listener's perspective, from the sharer's perspective. So, you know, that I lo all love. The location-specific stuff, I think, is probably a little overplayed for my personal taste. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's more of kind of a, a gimmick than really valuable. Let's see what the top tracks are in my neighborhood or my, my city. Um, is not all that interesting to me. But, you know, from the other perspective of the activity feed of, of uh, what people are listening to across various services is cool. And, you know, the, kind of the, the, their secret sauce is supposedly they've, they've been able to tap into the uh, – into the default music app on an iPhone yeah, to yeah. Uh, pull out metadata of what's being played in there, which, uh, to my knowledge, other people have not been able to do yet. Exactly, so, not even LastFM. Yeah, so, so. That, that's the most interesting thing, and I, I don't yet. know how they're doing it, although I want to dig out, dig around and, <laughs> and figure it out. I don't Maybe audio bus? I don't know if that's a way into the default um, music app or not. Uh, apparently, it's Eddie, Eddie Q approved. Uh, directly, uh, so interesting, okay. interesting yeah. tidbit of information. But, uh, uh, but, very, but yeah. very, very, very well done app. Yeah, I thought it was, I'm impressed with it. Yeah, so yeah, I, I've been interested to see what happens with it. I mean, I, I, I really like it. I, I also think that people listen to a lot of music, and so the feed does become really cluttered really quickly, or, or you know, you, or you miss a lot of stuff. But that's that's kind of like Twitter. You know, you miss a lot of stuff because you're not on Twitter all the time. So whether that's just a way that it's supposed to be in, it's going to be left that way, or whether there's going to be a way of categorizing, perhaps like looking at a specific 
specific users and and checking out what they've been listening to specifically that that that's uh, i guess uh, uh, still uh, in the works because it's only the first release but uh, but yeah an interesting application i don't know if you guys have uh, have heard of it or have checked it out uh, yet uh, jeff or marcus no, but uh, uh, go and have a look and let me know what you think. Uh, it's uh, it should be on the App Store uh, when this uh, when this is released. So go and check out Soundwave and see see what you, see what you think. And that's uh, I think that's all for this week. Uh, we're uh, uh, towards the end of the show. Thanks so much for uh, coming on, guys. It was great having you on, and we didn't have any Skype problems, which is uh, incredible. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, you know, go and check out uh, uh, Tomahawk. Uh, go and check out check out Audium and and also uh, Harbor Ventures. Uh, I'm going to put the links in the show notes. And thanks so much for listening to the show. Uh, check out digitalmusictrends.com for all the latest episodes. Uh, there's also the DMT one-to-one show, which is a weekly show with individual projects and startups uh, where we highlight what they're working on and uh, uh, what's happening in, in some specific digital marketing uh, uh, projects. And uh, also check out Digital Music Trends, uh, uh, sorry, uh, youtube.com slash digital music trends for uh, all the latest interviews. I did uh, almost 90 interviews I think since uh, medium uh, individual interviews with uh, uh, people from startups, uh, you know, uh, labels, uh, publishers, uh, uh, digital marketing agencies. So there's quite a wealth of information there. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to try and do a better job at categorizing it and making sure that people uh, can find it easily. But uh, yeah, go and check it out. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great week. And until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.